In the second part of the lecture today, uh, we're going to first go over some reminders on dimensional analysis and converting units uh, to one another. Uh, this is a very important topic in traffic flow analysis uh, and when you're working with traffic data because, as I said earlier, it's very important to make sure the units are consistent and uh, you're actually working with the right unit. So if you're going to work with kilometer per hour or kilometer per seconds or minutes or passengers per hour or, you know, number of vehicles per minute or hour. So um, you want to make sure all the units are consistent in your analysis. So um, an easy example would be if you want to convert, uh, for example, uh, trains per hour to passenger per hour. So in this case, the example is, imagine we have six trains per hour, and if we assume each train um, has 10 cars, um, and um, each car has 50 passengers, then we can easily say six trains multiplied by 10 cars per train and 50 passengers per car. So uh, train by train will cross out, cars where cars will cross out. So we'll end up with six multiplied by 10 multiplied by 50, which would be 3000 passengers over hour, right? Same thing with converting miles per hour to kilometer per hour. So imagine we wanna convert miles per hour to kilometer per hour. So we have 60 miles per hour. Um, there, there is um, 5,280 feet in one mile. And then in each feet, it, it, there we have 12 inches in each feet. And then um, every one inch is actually 2.14 centimeter. Then every 100 centimeter is one meter then every 1,000 meters is one kilometer. So if you just write that, again, I'm making these things complicated here unnecessarily, but I just want to show you that we can easily convert units to another. And then if you just cross things out, so meter by meter will cross out, centimeter will cross out, inch, inch, feet, feet, mile, mile. So what we'll end up having is kilometer, over hour here, and then if you multiply 60 by this 5,280, multiply by 12, multiply by 2.054, divided by 100, divided by 1,000, you'll get to 96.6 kilometer per hour. So again, make sure you do the dimensional analysis uh, whenever you work with traffic data. There is another uh, thing that is very useful in traffic flow theory, and we've, we've already seen this in previous uh, lectures, and that is triangles. We have a lot of triangles when it comes to working with trajectories, working with fundamental diagram, working with traffic uh, data. We can use triangles to actually solve many problems. So we know the slope of a triangle here is actually rise divided by run. So this is called rise, this is called run, or height or base. So it's rise over run or height over base. And the area of the triangle is obviously half of rise multiply by run, right? So we know the area, we know how to get the slope. So some basic measurements, um, consider a single vehicle at one point. Imagine you are standing on the side of the road here and this is a road and you are basically recording, uh, you, you stand at that point, you establish a, a line across the road and you record passage time of every vehicle. So for example, vehicle one, uh, passes your point at time 90209. The second vehicle comes at 904. The, the third vehicle comes at 906. The fourth vehicle and all the way to ninth vehicle that comes at 914. And if you record this data, you can actually visualize it um, in a diagram um, that is usually called uh, a cumulative plot. where x-axis is time, and y-axis is the cumulative number of vehicles that you are counting. Or you can represent it by vehicle number as well. So in this case, look, vehicle number one arrives at time 9.2. So that's vehicle number one. 
nothing happens in between. So n, n remains horizontal. And then at time 9.4, we'll, we'll see a one jump where the second vehicle comes. So the cumulative numbers would be two, then three, then four, five. So this is stepwise function can be plotted and will just move up one unit whenever a vehicle uh, gets recorded in our uh, record of the passage times, right? Um, and we sometimes also represent, approximate this cumulative curve by a continuous line, which I'll talk, which I'll talk more about later, but um, this is called a cumulative plot, okay? So have it for now and we'll talk more about this cumulative plots later. Um, now we can actually, having this data, we can actually calculate flow, right? Because in this case, we can see we have calculated, we have recorded nine vehicles passing over, what, from, from time nine to 9.15, we counted nine vehicles. So flow is basically nine vehicles over 15 minutes. And if you want to convert that to a vehicle per hour, we just need to multiply it by 60 minutes per one hour. That would be equal to 36 vehicle per hour, and that is flow. So as long as you have this passage record data, you can actually calculate flow from it. And again, when it comes to flow, it doesn't have to be, as I said before, it doesn't have to be always cars. You can calculate um, the flow for any moving object. It can be flow for pedestrians, ants, uh, I don't know, birds, buses in this case. So uh, in the context of public transport, um, uh, we usually call flow frequency because it's the same thing, right? So number of buses over time, how many buses would you count passing a certain point on the road over a sp specific period of time? That's usually called flow, but in the context of uh, public transport, that's also called frequency. And again, as we learned before, there is a relationship between flow and headway, right? Where the headway was the inverse of, the average headway was equal to inverse of average flow. And in this case, in the context of public transport, it would be one over uh, frequency would give us the average uh, headway of buses um, arriving at any specific point. So, um, just a simple example of that flows can actually go beyond traffic flow and can actually be used maybe with a slightly different terminology in the public transport context as well. Um, so a summary of the units here. So we said we have flow and frequency. They can interchangeably be used. Frequency is more used in the public transport context. Flow is used more in is used is more is more used in the uh, traffic context. We usually refer them as Q. We usually represent them by Q. The units is vehicles per time or buses per time, and it's obviously the unit is one over time. And headway is actually the inverse of flow. So it would be time over vehicle or time over buses. And the unit is actually time. Um, we can also measure the point of speeds of a vehicle. Um, where this would be the time mean of speed, if you remember from previous slides, where we say, Time mean of speed, VT or UT, it's actually measured by distance over time, uh, which the unit can be kilometer per hour or meter per second or whatever. And it is the arithmetic mean of um, every individual vehicle, um, vehicle's speed, the arithmetic mean of the speed of every individual vehicle. If you take that average, you'll get the time mean of speed. Um, now imagine two aerial photographs that are taken at two different times, T1 and T2. Imagine you're flying over the road um, and you take one snapshot at time T1 from the sky and another snapshot at time T2. So what, what, what differences do you see in these two pictures? You see that, for example, this vehicle moves up a little bit from here to here. The other vehicle also moves up a little bit. All the vehicles actually, slightly move up, right? And if you want to calculate the um, actual space mean speed, um, this is how we can, we, we can, 
uh, we can go with it. That um, the speed of vehicle number one, imagine this is vehicle number one, uh, at time T1, it was at X lo at location X1, at time T2, the same vehicle was at location X2. So speed is simply the distance traveled, X2 minus X1 is the distance traveled uh, over the time period, uh, the time difference between the two aerial photographs that we have taken. And now if we collect a set of vehicle speeds measure over a space as we did it and then compute the mean, we'll come up with the space mean speed for this specific segment. Because the individual speeds that we are calculating are already a space mean speed, uh, if we take a regular average of these individual space mean speed, we'll get the uh, average space mean speed um, for this whole section of the road. Going back to the previous slides, as we said, um, this was the time mean speed, right? If we if we use a radar gun, for example, to calculate to, to measure the uh, the spot speed or the instantaneous speed of the vehicles, if we take the arithmetic mean of those individual time uh, individual spot speeds, it will give us time mean speed. But if we take the harmonic mean, it will give us the space mean speed. Um, so again, some refreshing. Um, on the difference between time mean speed and space mean speed. Uh, so time mean speed is a speed that is measured at one point averaged over time, while a space mean speed is measured over a segment averaged over space. Um, there's also a term, old term called pace, uh, where it is the inverse of uh, average speed. So uh, pace is simply the inverse of average speed. And because the speed, the unit is, let's say, kilometer per hour, so the unit of pace would be hour per kilometer or it would be time over distance. So pace is the inverse of a speed. Now, if you put all these measures into a summary table, uh, so we'll have uh, flow, which is number of vehicles over time. We have density, which is vehicles over distance. We have a speed, which is distance over time. Um, and then if we can, if you relate them, if you re if you relate all these in a fundamental diagram, so this is the fundamental diagram that you're looking at, the relationship between density and flow, right? Um, and you can see here is not necessarily exactly uh, um, a green shields model is a slightly different than green shields model. I mean, we don't care about uh, the actual model here, but um, if you look at this fundamental diagram, which is relating density and flow, so I have, for example, at this specific flow, this would be my density, right? So this would be my K1. And also get another K1, right? For every flow, I will have two values for density, one on the uncongested branch and the other one is on the congested, congested branch. So this one is uncongested, the other one is congested. Um, and what is interesting here is that, uh, remember the traffic flow and fundamental identity, which is K equal KV. So at every point on this fundamental diagram, which we usually call traffic state, if I draw a line from this point to the origin, like this line, what does this what does the slope of this line represent? So at any point on the fundamental diagram, if I draw a line from that point to the origin, or I can be even here, sorry, I can be even here. If I draw a line all the way to the origin, what does the slope of this line represent? The slope of this line, if you remember from the triangles, would actually be the rise over run, right? And the rise is actually delta Q while the run is delta K. So I can actually have some Q over K and that is equal to speed, right? So if you work with the fundamental diagram, if you work with the relationship between um, density and flow, at any point on the fundamental diagram, if you draw it, if you draw a line, to the origin, the slope of that line would represent the speed. And that is just a visual illustration of uh, the traffic flow identity 
inside the context of traffic flow fundamental diagram. So consider a five meter vehicle traveling at 30. So imagine this is a vehicle which is five meter and it is traveling with 30 kilometer per hour. How close together might we expect two vehicles to travel comfortably? So let's say if we say um, these, these two vehicles are following each other with a spacing of three vehicles, the spacing can be actually illustrated here from the front bumper of this vehicle to the rear bumper of this vehicle. So this distance is called spacing, if you remember. And again, this would be if the vehicle is five meter long, this distance is obviously three vehicles. So that would be a 15 meter distance of spacing. But what would be the headway? So we have the spacing, but what would be the headway in this case? So um, what was the unit of the headway? So the unit of the headway is actually one over flow. So headway, the unit is actually time over uh, vehicles, right? So what we need to calculate here is the time to travel four vehicles length. So if I want to convert that spacing to headway, I need to look at um, how long it takes for four vehicles to actually pass. So in this case, I have this 15 meter distance and we know the speed is 30 kilometer per hour. So the time that it takes to actually go um, uh, to actually go 15 meter to, 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 to travel 15 meter is 15 over 30 here, and that's meter over kilometer per hour. So I need to do some unit conversion here because I can't really cross meter by kilometer here. And I wanna get that in seconds, for example. So I need to convert that to um, 3,600 seconds per hour, and I have one kilometer over 1,000 meter. And if you convert, if you calculate that, you get to, you get to 1.8 seconds. So that's, um, that's the headway. And then if I want to calculate, if I want to convert the headway to flow, we knew that flow is one over H. So it would be one vehicle over 1.8 seconds. And then if I want to calculate that, uh, get that in vehicle per kilo, per vehicle per hour, I just need to do the unit correct unit conversion. So I multiply by that 3,600 seconds per hour. So I get 2,000 vehicle per hour. So look, by just knowing the speed and I knowing the spacing, I was able to calculate headway. I was able to calculate flow using all the traffic flow relationships that we've uh, learned so far. Now let's add a traffic signal. So I have these vehicles moving and imagine this is an intersection here and we have a traffic signal. So two interrupted traffic streams must now share the right of way. Assume a simple 60 second cycle with 30 seconds phase for each approach. So 60 second cycles. We'll, we'll talk about this cycles and phase terminologies uh, in a future lecture, but for now cycle length is actually um, the time that it takes um, for the traffic signal to actually come back to its initial uh, timing. So every, every approach gets a green and then it comes back to the same approach. That's called cycle length and then 30 seconds phases. So imagine we give 30 seconds green to this phase first, and then we'll get, we give 30 seconds green to another, uh, to another approach. What would be the capacity of this approach now? If the capacity of this approach without the traffic signal, so if the Q cap was 2000 vehicle per hour before, when, when there was no traffic signal, what does this traffic light do to the capacity? Because we're actually splitting the time into two, two parts, two equal parts. We give green, 30 seconds green to this approach and another 30 seconds green to the other approach. That means we are actually taking half of the time from each approach uh, in our timeline. What it does is it actually makes capacity half as well. So the capacity of this approach would be 2000 multiply a half. Where does this half come from? It's the, we call that the G over C. 
is the green time over the cycle length. So this is the green time over the cycle length. So 30 seconds over 60 seconds. This is half. So G over C multiplied by that 2000, which was the original capacity of that road without a signal. So that means um, this is actually 1000 vehicle per hour, sorry. So the capacity would now be 1000 vehicle per hour. So you can see adding a simple traffic signal is actually reducing the capacity of the road by half. If the G over C, if the green over cycle ratio was different for this approach, imagine the cycle length was 60 seconds, but the green here was, let's say it was 20 seconds over 60 seconds. So we had 20 seconds green for this approach and 40 seconds green for the other approach. The capacity of this approach would be 20 over 60 multiplied by 2000. What would, what, what, what would be the capacity of the other approach? The other approach would be uh, 40 seconds over 60 seconds multiplied by 2000. So the capacity of each approach really depends on how much green time they get at the traffic signal. Um, now let's think about the minimum spacing, maximum density, minimum headway, maximum flow. Again, uh, we talked about the relationship between the speed and density, sorry, we, we talked about the relationship between the spacing and density, headway and flow before. It might also be useful to think about what the word capacity means in this context. Capacity is a tricky word to work with. I mean, there are, there, are, there are a lot of papers in the literature that talk about how can we actually measure capacity? What is capacity? Is it, sometimes we say capacity is defined as the maximum flow. Sometimes we say not necessarily because maximum flow may only happen very rarely. Capacity is actually, um, for example, um, the flow right before the breakdown happens. So there are many different definitions of capacity uh, that can be used. Um, but, in, but in the case of a traffic, a traffic signal, um, we learned that capacity is actually very dependent on um, the way the traffic signal is operating. Um, and it is highly dependent on the G over C ratio. Let's have a look at an example, again, relating to the time mean speed and space mean speed. Um, to make sure you're all very familiar and clear about the differences. So consider a one kilometer long uh, elliptical uh, racetrack with five fast cars uh, that are traveling at 80 kilometer per hour and four slow trucks. So these blue ones are trucks that are going uh, for 50 kilometer per hour. And these red ones, are uh, fast cars that are going with 80 kilometer per hour. What is the proportion of a slow vehicles as seen from an aerial photograph in person? So uh, in percentages. So if you're flying, imagine you're flying on, on top of this racetrack, this ring road, we can easily uh, calculate the proportion of a slow vehicles, right? Because we only see uh, four trucks and five fast cars. So the proportion of a slow vehicles here would be uh, just four over total of nine vehicles. So that give us that gives us 44.4%. Uh, so we see four fast trucks out of nine total vehicles. What is the space mean of speed on the track, again, as seen from the series of the aerial photographs? Again, imagine you're still flying on the road and you're taking multiple photographs and you wanna calculate the space mean of speed. In this case, because we know the actual space mean of speed of every individual vehicle here, the way we need to calculate it is I have five fast cars. They're going with 80 kilometer per hour. I have four sm slow trucks that each of them is going with 50 kilometer per hour over a total of nine vehicles. That gives me 66.6 .6 kilometer per hour. So this would be the space mean speed as we capture it um, from the sky using a series of aerial photographs. 
The last part of the example is asking, will the proportion of slow vehicles that would be seen by a stationary observer over time who is positioned somewhere along the track is higher or lower than the observed from the aerial? So now imagine I have an observer standing on the side of the road here. So this is me standing on the side of the road. And I'm I'm capturing I'm calculating this the, I'm I'm, cap, I'm, cap, I'm I'm capturing the um, uh, the speed of the vehicles and um, I'm counting the vehicles basically. The question is asking: Will the proportion of a slow vehicles that I would see if I stand on the side of the road be higher or lower than the observed? Uh, proportion from the aerial graph. So the observed proportion from the aerial photographs was 44.4%, right? But do we expect the proportion of a slow vehicles to be higher or lower if I'm standing on the side of the road? The proportion will actually be lower. Why? Because fast because the speed of the fast cars are much higher than the slow cars. When I'm standing on the side of the road, I naturally observe more fast cars because they finish the circle more frequently. While the slow trucks are slow, so if I start counting the number of vehicles that I see, I would count a lot of fast cars and I would count less number of trucks because I'm standing on the side of the road compared to the aerial photographs. Uh, so let's actually do, let's actually calculate that proportion. So um, if I'm standing on the side of the road here, how many trucks would I see in an hour? So the number of trucks I, I would see in an hour is every truck is going 50 kilometer per hour and I have four trucks. So that would give me 200 vehicle per hour. So in, 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 in a time period of one hour, I would observe 200 trucks circling around that uh, racetrack. And how many fast cars would I see? I'm standing on the side of the road. The speed of the fast cars uh, is 80 kilometer per hour. And I have five vehicles going around this one kilometer ring. So the flow that I would see is actually 400 fast cars per hour. So this would be the flow of the, so let's call this Q truck, let's call this Q car. So this would be the flow that I would see, this would be the flow that I would count uh, when I'm standing on the side of the road. And then what would be the proportion of the slow trucks? It would be, 200 over 400 plus 200. So that's 33.33%. So interestingly, when I'm standing on the side of the road, the proportion of the trucks that I would count is only 33%. While if I do the same calculation of the proportion when I'm looking at the racetrack from the sky is actually 44%. So again, confirming what I said before, that if I'm standing on the side of the road, the proportion of the slow vehicles that I would see is actually lower than the observed uh, proportion from a series of the aerial photographs. And again, this is all related to how uh, the space mean speed and time mean speed is um, um, defined and calculated in this case. Now, what would be the time mean speed in, 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 in this case? So uh, again, if I'm standing on the side of the road here, we calculated flow of the truck, we calculated the flow of the vehicles, and um, the, the time mean speed here would be the arithmetic mean of the instantaneous speed that I see. So the average time, the, the time mean speed would be um, 200 multiplied by 50 plus 400 multiplied by 80 divided by the total number of vehicles that I would count. So I have 200 vehicles, going around in one hour with a speed of 50. Um, I have 400 uh, vehicles that are going around with the, with, with the speed of 80. And then if I calculate that, I would get 70 
kilometer per hour. So this would be my time minus speed. What was the space minus speed as we calculated before? While the space minus speed was 66. So time minus speed, so let's call that VT, and then VS, it was 66.66 kilometer per hour. So again, confirming what we talked before in previous lectures that uh, in this case, VT is uh, greater than um, VS. So when do we expect VT to be equal to VS? We only expect to we only expect time minus speed being equal to a space minus speed when the traffic is homogeneous, meaning that there is no variation in the speeds. If if all the vehicles on the road are going with a constant and identical speed, if all of them are going with 50 kilometer per hour, if, if all of them are going with 80 kilometer per hour, time minus speed would be equal to uh, uh, space minus speed. Now, uh, let's get back into the time and space diagram and consider we're taking a series of aerial photographs. Uh, so at time t1, I take this photograph. At time t2, I take another photograph. You can see the vehicle has moved. All vehicles have moved up a little bit, right? And I continue taking all these photographs. So um, I'll take multiple photographs uh, over um, time. And if I if I connect all these uh, vehicles that are moving up over time, what do I actually get? What, what, what are these lines that I'm drawing? These lines are actually representing the trajectory of the vehicles obtained from a series of the aerial photographs, right? So I will end up with a time and space diagram and the trajectories. And as I said before, the time and space diagram is a very fundamental tool for transportation evaluation and traffic analysis. It can be constructed from aerial photos, or it can be up, it can be constructed from GPS uh, traces of vehicles. We can use time and space diagram to study movement and interactions of the vehicles. Uh, every vehicle will be represented with one trajectory. The slope of the trajectory represents a speed. Um, the curvature of the trajectory or the second derivative of the distance over time would represent the acceleration. And then we can actually also see how vehicles are interacting. And if we have two trajectories intersecting each other in a time and space diagram, so imagine this is one trajectory and the other trajectory is going over the other trajectory, that actually means these ve this vehicle is passing uh, over the other, the other vehicle. So another refreshment here that uh, if we have trajectories within the time and space diagram, the horizontal distance between two consecutive trajectories represents headway. The vertical distance represents a spacing. And if I want to calculate um, flow, I need to specify a time window of delta t. And at any location on the road, I would just count how many vehicles I would see within that, within that time period at this location. And that would give me uh, the flow. If I want to calculate, so in this case, it would be I only see two vehicles at this location within this delta T. So that flow would be uh, two vehicles divided by whatever time window we're looking at. So if, if this time window is T. If I want to calculate density, density measurement is over space. So at any specific time, if I look at a, a stretch of a section of the road with a distance of L, and I count how many vehicles I would see here, I would see one, two, three, four, five, six. So K here would actually be six vehicles divided by L. We can also use time and space diagram to actually calculate um, delay. So imagine this um, uh, set of trajectories within this time and space diagram. So this is specific vehicle that I'm drawing on is going with a constant of speed. For whatever reason, it slows down, it decelerates, right? The curvature is downward. Then it accelerates, and then it goes with a constant of speed. If I want to calculate delay 
but but how do we define delay here? Delay is actually the time between um, the time between the free flow travel time and the actual experience time. So delay is defined as experienced travel time minus the free flow travel time. So if the vehicle here was, go, if, if the vehicle was able to continue with the constant speed as it was going originally, the trajectory would have looked like this, right? So the trajectory would have looked like this. But for whatever reason, the vehicle had to slow down, then accelerate and then go. So at this location, at this, at this location, if I want to calculate the delay at this point on the road, the difference between the free flow travel time and the actual travel time, so this horizontal distance here would give me the delay, right? If I wanted to calculate the delay at another location on the road, here, imagine, the delay would look different because, yes, this was the trajectory of the vehicle if it if it didn't have to slow down and this is now the actual trajectory so the horizontal distance here is the time difference between the free flow travel time and the actual tra and the actual travel time or the actual trajectory that is going by so this horizontal difference here would be the delay at this location So again, there's so many things that can be extracted from time and space diagram. If we have trajectory data, there are tons of measurements, tons of performance measures that we can actually extract uh, from this rich data set. So we talked about delay, we talked about the actual or experienced travel time, free flow travel time,